you will hear a science student inquiring about English courses at a university language centre. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That mm -hmm. means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Oh. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. OK, quite a variety then. Mm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12 and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> it would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes. But we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. Okay. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook, as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks.
Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a recorded message by an employee of an investment society giving information about savings and investment options. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Welcome to the information line of the State Investment Society. Why would you choose to put your money into an investment society and not a bank? Well, SIS offers everything you'd expect from a bank, but the difference is we're a cooperative. We're one hundred percent owned by our customers, people like you. And that means we always put your best interests first. You won't see our profits going into large foreign-owned finance corporations. No, you'll see them coming back to you and your local community. As a cooperative, we work hard to keep our fees competitive and absolutely minimal. Even better, we can advise you about ways to avoid fees. Here are some suggestions. Firstly, we recommend you carry out as much of your personal banking as possible with us. We won't charge account fees unless your account becomes inactive for some reason. See, no unnecessary fees. Secondly, if you maintain certain minimum account balances, you won't have to pay any transaction charges for transferring money between any accounts that have the same customer number. Although there may be some service charges that apply, such as the establishment of automatic payments, so how can we help you? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions fourteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fourteen to twenty. Let's look first at savings options. We can give you three options. Our internet account earns you interest from your very first dollar deposited. You don't have to maintain a minimum balance, and you earn a good interest rate from the start. Interest calculated daily and paid into your account monthly. You always have immediate access to your money by using the internet, text, or telephone banking. What's more, there are no account or transaction fees. With our Stairs Saver scheme, the more you save, the higher interest you earn. Again, there's no minimum balance, but as your balance grows, you'll earn higher interest rates. There are three interest tiers or steps plus bonus interest. Interest is calculated daily and paid monthly. Now, what about access to your money? You are free to make as many withdrawals as you like, but if you restrict them to one a month and your balance increases over that month, then you'll earn that bonus interest. With our simple saver scheme, access is available any time, and we don't impose penalties for withdrawals. This scheme has one interest rate. No minimum balance, and interest is calculated daily and paid annually at the end of the financial year, the thirtieth of June. So you can see that savings accounts are ideal if you're starting from scratch. Do you know you can open a savings account with as little as ten dollars? They're usually the best choice for short-term financial goals. For the longer term, we recommend some kind of investment account. Let's take a look at our investment options, starting with the safest, the most secure, low-risk option is a basic term deposit, starting with a minimum deposit of one thousand dollars. Interest is calculated daily, but you can choose whether to have it paid out monthly, quarterly, or at maturity. 
What we recommend if you really want to see money grow is having interest compounded quarterly. You'll only get access to your funds when your term deposit matures, so be sure to think carefully about the amount of time before you lock it away. It could be anything from six months to five years. Bonds are generally a longer commitment, but they may bring better rewards in the future. There is a minimum deposit of $5,000 and interest is calculated daily. You may choose to have interest compounded quarterly or paid out quarterly. And of course, you'll have access to your money when your bond reaches maturity. Looking really long term, there is our retirement fund, which is, of course, a savings plan for retirement. There is no minimum deposit, but the good news is that you can choose to contribute a certain percentage of your income before tax is paid on it. As for interest, well, you choose a particular type of fund which has a different level of return depending on the level of risk. And access? Well, not before you turn 60 years old. As I said, it's a retirement scheme. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Excuse me, Dr Owen, I... Oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question and I was wondering if I could change my paper to Investment in Knowledge, comparing some European countries with the United States and then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average. I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals. Mm -hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material, when you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. 
I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through is the IT department section on the university site, which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll take that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock. It's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it and will just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a lecture's introduction to Insect Biology 101. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon and welcome to Insect Biology 101. I'd like to begin this course with a few remarks about good insects and bad ones. Bugs are all around us and that's both a benefit and an annoyance. Sometimes maybe even serious harm. First, let's talk about the good things that insects do for us. Probably the most important insect for humans and maybe for all other life, is the bee. Bees help plants in the process of pollination and thus are necessary to most flowers and fruit-producing trees. That is, they carry pollen from male flowers to female. If it weren't for bees, we'd have very few food plants and no fruit either. In fact, there would be no we. 
no lesser thinker than Albert Einstein pointed out that without bees, humanity would be dead within a year or less. We'd starve. It's that simple. That should maybe make us just a little humble. A little less dramatic is the fact that bees also make the honey we eat. Moreover, they produce beeswax, which is useful in candles and is also used as a first-rate furniture polish. Sure, these may not be vital to our lives, but they can serve as reminders of how important bees are. That's a point I keep coming back to in this course. Though, in all fairness, I should point out that butterflies aid in pollination as well as bees. Now, here in Michigan, what's the worst part of summer? Yep, that's right, mosquitoes. But I'm talking about helpful insects, right? So let's look at the dragonfly first. If there were no dragonflies, there would be even more mosquitoes. Dragonflies mainly eat mosquitoes and also a few other insects. Yes, that's right. They don't just fly around. And they also help to eliminate harmful insects. So the next time you see a dragonfly, don't you dare kill it. Now, let's talk a little about those harmful insects. Take the mosquitoes I just mentioned as an example. Not so many years ago, mosquitoes here in America weren't just annoying, some were even deadly. They carried malaria and yellow fever. My own ancestor, the Confederate General John Bell Hood, lived through the worst battles of civil war, only to die at age 38 from yellow fever. A pest, not a bullet. Well, besides the mosquitoes, in summer there is also a kind of insect that never seems tired. Right, that is the fly. Before I go on talking, I must mention an African fly called the tsetse fly, which feeds on blood and can cause serious diseases in the people and animals that it bites. Besides, it is still a bearer of sleeping sickness, which affects around 300,000 people every year in Africa and can be treated only with toxic drugs that are hard to administer. Worse still, the drugs sometimes don't work. Other insects, of course, destroy food crops. In China, for instance, locusts continue to be a danger to the harvest in some areas. Less important, but still annoying, moths eat people's clothes and dust mites slowly destroy carpets. Worse, but still in the home, termites or white ants eat wood, the wood of your house. If they are not stopped, they can eventually destroy the whole building. Usually they seriously damage a building before anyone even notices them. So, as we all know, insects can be a real trouble. So, what to do? You can go ahead and start killing harmful insects. In the early decades after the communist revolution in China, Chairman Mao encouraged the people to swat every fly they could see. Slogans on the walls of buildings called them little capitalists. But flies reproduce too quickly for this to be a long-term solution. For some decades in the West, to kill insects with chemicals seemed a good remedy. Unfortunately, chemicals can only be used in a limited area for a limited time. It's a small-scale solution. The insects come back. Worse still, some of the poisons used, like DDT, were found harmful to the environment. Many kinds of wildlife, like hawks, were harmed. And people in chemical-using rural areas have one of the highest rates of liver cancer in the world. It's no secret that chemicals remain harmful to humans. Like all species, insects adapt to their changing environments at an amazing rate. When a new chemical is introduced to their habitat, the insects that survive are generally the ones with some way of resisting the harmful effects. They then breed with the other survivors, and just like that, insects become resistant to most poison in a few generations. An insect generation, remember, is a couple of months at most. So again, we have to ask, what to do? Well, there are biological solutions. Some of these are pretty simple. One is destroying the insect's habitat. You take away their home or food. Cleaning your kitchen is the best way to prevent roaches. No garbage, no food. Getting rid of marshes and swamps eliminates mosquitoes. Other solutions might include bringing in dragonflies or bats in areas where mosquitoes are many. This is a cheaper alternative to chemicals. 
Biological methods like this also bring no extra pollution to the environment. But you have to be careful. If you change the environment too much, you might be hurting other forms of life accidentally. One recent method of controlling insect populations involves interrupting their breeding cycle. What does that mean? It means birth control for bugs. Insects are provided with food that makes them unable to reproduce. Since they can't have babies, the population disappears, or nearly so. And since no young are born, resistance is not a problem, with no young insects developing increased resistance. Interrupt the life cycle, eliminate the bug. It's clear that we must have an understanding of the life cycle of the insect. At least, that's the plan. We'll go into more detail as the course goes along. Now, I will stop here to see whether you have any questions or not. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.